Hello, good evening. My name is Diana Munn and I am Director of Public Programs at the Harvard Museums of Science and Culture. It is my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's Evolution Matters Lecture, sponsored by the Harvard Museum of Natural History. We are delighted to have Dr. Matthew Carano with us tonight to discuss the making of a truly amazing exhibition that helps the public experience and understand the evolution of plant and animal life. I would like to take a moment to recognize Drs. Herman and Joan Suit for their generous sponsorship of the Evolution Matters Lecture Series. They have sponsored this series for the past 10 years, and it is their support that allows us to present and record these lectures. We actually have one more lecture in the series this semester, which will take place on Wednesday, October 14th. Harvard professor Javier Ortega Hernandez will discuss some of the earliest known organisms from the Cambrian period and their role in the earliest evolution of animals. Please visit our website, hmsc.harvard.edu, to register and to learn more about other virtual events we have planned for the fall season. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Matthew Carano. Dr. Carano has been curator of dinosauria in the Department of Paleobiology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History since 2003. His research examines the evolutionary relationships of predatory dinosaurs, the paleoecology of Mesozoic ecosystems, and the quality of the terrestrial fossil record. Karana received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Geology Biology from Brown University, and his Master's and PhD in Organismal Biology and Anatomy at the University of Chicago. He has conducted fieldwork from Montana and Wyoming to Madagascar, Chile, and Zimbabwe, and brought thousands of new specimens to the NMNH collections. He has published dozens of scientific papers and co-edited the journal Paleobiology. He is also co-author of Visions of Lost Worlds, The Paleo Art of J. Matterness. Carano has served such scientific organizations as the Jurassic Foundation, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, and the Paleontological Society, as well as the Paleobiology Database. At the National Museum of Natural History, Carano has been involved in many outreach, education, and exhibit projects. He created Dinosaurs in Our Backyard, the first Smithsonian exhibit to feature fossils from the Washington, D.C. region, and was a featured curator excuse me, in the temporary exhibit since Darwin, The Evolution of Evolution. He was the lead curator for the Deep Time Exhibition, the first complete renovation of the paleontology halls in the museum's history, which opened in 2019, and which um, he will discuss tonight. I uh, actually got a chance to visit this exhibit last year with my family, and I was really blown away by its specimens, by the content, and the many ways it teaches people of all ages and backgrounds about the evolution of life on Earth. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Carano. Thank you very much, Diana. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you all. Um, it's uh, quite a thing to be a part of an exhibit renovation like this, um, and I'm going to try to encapsulate it and give you a few practical illustrations of what we tried to accomplish. Um, of course, at the moment, I can't invite you to see it, but we hope to be able um, to do so in the not too distant future. So we really had the idea to renovate our paleontology exhibit um, even before I arrived at the Smithsonian. And the motivation came out of the understanding that the exhibit as different as it was um, in say 2001 from its very first incarnation uh, when the building opened in 1911, um, the content of it in many ways had not changed as much as we'd like. Um, we'd added a lot of things, but not really um, gone so far as to overhaul the entire exhibit. Um, and over this time, it's not simply true to say that paleontology has learned a lot. There have been a number of important, uh, really kind of revolutionary moments in how we look at and understand the past and the history of life on earth. And it was very difficult to try to incorporate such broad changes in understanding 
uh, into an existing exhibit structure. So we had been um, moving along with this for some time, um, thinking about uh, renovating parts of it. And then we came to this realization it really had to be done in its entirety. To give you a little bit of history, um, paleontology has always been a part of the exhibits at the Smithsonian. Originally in the only building, the castle that was um, first built, um, but in the 1880s moved to the first U.S. National Museum in the building we now call Arts and Industries. And um, that didn't last very long, uh, really only about 30 years before um, it was simply too small to house the collections. And the current U.S. National Museum building, uh, now known as the National Museum of Natural History, was constructed in 1910, and all of the exhibits then moved into that building. Um, the first hall was called the Hall of Vertebrate Fossils. Not a very exciting name, but uh, sufficiently descriptive. And um, that hall um, sort of morphed along the way into a variety of different things, um, all while staying in the same room. It became the Hall of Extinct Monsters in the 1930s as it acquired more and more uh, dinosaur specimens. Um, in the 1960s, there was a, a major set of renovations that attempted to create a, a more cohesive thematic treatment of the material. Um, however, without actually moving it or um, undoing uh, everything that had been done before. And a similar kind of renovation took place in the 1980s. And so um, when we began our renovation um, in 2011, we were faced with this uh, kind of accumulated set of uh, acquisitions, displays, and changes over the history, this long history of this exhibit. Uh, you can see on the top uh, left, that's an early version of the hall, um, 1917, and 19, by the 1930s, um, it had acquired this very large sauropod dinosaur. And in the 1960s, on the bottom left, um, this was when it acquired a little bit more of a stylistic cohesion. Um, in, in the color photos, it's, it's very much of a Mad Men era design. And then in the 1980s, it was, uh, was the most recent uh, version. And it had really gotten to be overfull, fairly dark. Um, the room originally had a skylight and, and a lot of windows. And at, by the end, it really, you could have been underground. It was very difficult to even know that you were um, in a room that should, should be very bright. So we conceived of this project, which was called Deep Time, as a way to address the needs of such a renovation, uh, because it was simply not simply a matter of the, the physical um, uh, undertaking, um, but, but the whole conceptual underpinning had to be addressed as well. And, um, you know, for any of you who are um, members of organizations, really of any kind, you understand what this means. This means meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of conversations, a lot of paperwork. Um, a lot of emails. Uh, we spent a couple of years with um, a very uh, solid core exhibit team uh, developing the main ideas and themes that we felt were the most important. And, and this was quite challenging because you're dealing with the history of life on earth. You're dealing with um, essentially everything that we know about life on earth. And that needs to be distilled down, even if it's going to fill a hall the size of ours, which is some 30,000 square feet. Um, quite a bit of editing to that story needs to take place. Um, and then furthermore, how is it to be presented? How do we address ideas we feel are important versus others? Now uh, at the Natural History Museum, uh, major exhibits in particular um, are, are formed around core teams that represent the three main um, groups within the institution. Obviously exhibits being uh, the primary one, but also our education and outreach group and then the researchers and the collections folks. And those three come together to create exhibits of this scale um, in the institution. And the names here represent what we co would call the core team, um, the sort of um, central members who were um, expected to um, really shepherd from beginning to end this exhibition, but uh, there's no earthly way that um, that could be the list of people involved. And in fact, we had to, to hire a number of outside organizations. Research Casting International is a, is a professional organization that handles the conservation, preparation, and mounting of fossil materials. Reich and Petch is a major museum design firm. Ewing Cole handled the the actual renovation of the physical building space, which was after all 100 years old. And then of course, um, even though we were within house dealing with um, a sizable paleobiology department, we had many external um, 
uh, colleagues that we needed to consult, um, as well as a host of, of artists um, of various media to bring all of this together. So you're talking about literally hundreds of people. Um, we, we had several motivating um, uh, factors for us um, about what the exhibit should do in a very general sense, um, but that um, underscored how we thought about things. Uh, we, we wanted this exhibit to have uh, some sort of relevance to our visitors. We weren't too worried that people would come. Uh, you know, if you build a paleontology exhibit, people will come and see it. Um, but it often feels like, you, you know, you may as well be visiting um, ancient alien landscapes uh, for all they have to do with uh, the here and now. So we wanted to strike a note of relevance. Um, we needed to understand what the visitors were going to bring with them, the kinds of understanding and, and interest that they had. And we also felt the design itself really needed to be quite functional, quite intuitive, if we were going to deal with any, um, any degree of complexity um, in what we presented. We also felt that um, it was important to have a point of view, scientific point of view on behalf of the museum uh, and to really strive to present uh, the knowledge that we, um, that we curate along with our specimens, not just information. Um, you know, 50 years ago, you might go to a museum, um, but today that's simply not the case. That information is freely available online to anybody. It's not what drives people to come. People want to see the objects and what we can present with those objects is what the museum in its long history of research um, understands about them and, and why those things are important. Um, so there was a um, long period of um, dismantling, um, more than a year really, uh, to get the old hall completely emptied. And uh, a lot of that is um, very painstaking and delicate work. We had fossils uh, mounted on the walls, 20 feet off the ground, in the walls, suspended from cables. Um, we found in dismantling the hall, many layers of previous exhibitry beneath the originals, which was kind of a, an enjoyable uh, quasi-archaeological experience for us. And we had some nice moments uh, of kind of walking back history. Um, this is a picture of the, the creation of the skeletal mount of our uh, Diplodocus skeleton. Um, and it's being installed um, in, it took about two years. It was, I think, finally ready in the early 1930s. Um, and we had to dismantle this skeleton as well. It was in the same, uh, almost the same place with the same armature. And so we were able to kind of freeze frame our efforts and uh, recreate this piece. And you can see how little modification had been done to the, the physical specimen um, in some 75 years. Eventually the room was cleared. We then could renovate the room itself. Um, and then we were left with a reproduction of the original space. So we reconstructed the original architecture, opened the skylight again, etc. And so we got back this room uh, that really we had never seen as a room um, in any of our lifetimes. In all our discussions, you know, we, uh, we went down a lot of paths and thought through a lot of different avenues and we settled on a few things that we thought would guide us uh, through the, the actual development of this exhibit. One was that in order to approach the history of life on earth, we had to settle on a few stories, a few narratives, and we picked three, uh, which I'll discuss in a minute. Um, we settled on a time axis, which is not really um, an innovation of any kind, but um, not a given either. Um, and we also wanted to highlight the research we do in the building without having it define the content of the exhibit. Um, the history of life on earth should be um, something that's a piece of general knowledge and not necessarily dictated by the uh, interests of our own staff. We have a lot of lovely fossils, um, some of them quite iconic. Um, we knew we wanted to use them quite strategically within the hall and within the design, but um, that the appeal of a fossil was not enough. It had to have a job in the exhibit. So there were some lovely specimens that did not make it into the renovation. And then media was a, it was a very important topic, um, both practical because in a long-term project like this, uh, you don't want to pick a technology in year one and expect that in year seven, it's still going to be good technology. Uh, but more importantly, the media needed to support the messages of the exhibit. We weren't going to install anything 
for its own sake. So we ended up with no um, AR or VR, for example. Um, and it needs to be quite durable in order to survive in our own exhibit hall with the number of visitors that we get. So just to kind of give you a brief view of what that complexity looks like, um, this was my attempt in year one and a half to summarize our content. We had settled on kind of three main themes. One is evolution of life on Earth. One, uh, the second one is um, ecosystems and how they change over time. And then the third is how does the Earth work? What are the systems and processes of the Earth? That how do they work and how do they relate to life on Earth? And I, I, I arrayed these in uh, time periods with potential um, places to talk about connections to ourselves, to highlight research, et cetera, um, just as a way to try to digest some of this information. It was really quite uh, challenging, but it did create a structure that allowed us to move forward, even if we didn't stick to it, um, you know, to the letter. And so our main themes we decided would be the narratives that, that, that someone could follow through the hall, but that we would try to direct to those visitors um, notions about how the world we live in today has some relationship to these stories. And so here's a bird's eye view of what the hall uh, looks like in plan. And there's the central gray shape, which is the main travel pathway through the exhibit. And it goes from past, from pre essentially present to past. We start in the ice ages and we go back to the origin of life. And, and we reversed it um, because we felt that in all the exhibits we had seen, um, there, were, there had been no good solution to the fundamental problem of visitors who want to see dinosaurs and exciting specimens being forced to learn a biochemistry lesson about the origin of life before they do so. So what we did is we put it at the other end where um, someone that interested may actually wish to stay and learn about that. And furthermore, when you walk into an exhibit about the Ice Ages, you're walking into an exhibit where humans are literally in the story. So the story becomes... Um, connected at the very first uh, step that they take. Um, but navigation, we knew would be a problem. So we um, created a, uh, a sort of a, a map and signpost system with a set of colors that the exhibit uses throughout. Um, there are places everywhere you stop where you can see where are you in time and whether you want to go backward and forward. And those colors on the right, that green uh, post, um, that green will appear in all of the platforms that relate to that time period. Here's a lovely drawing from Ration Pecha giving you a sense of where we were probably about three quarters of the way through our design, the color coding evident, of course, in the platforms. Um, and this was really helpful for just trying to kind of coalesce things. Um, we, we picked apart the, the, the sort of perennial problem of talking to people about how old the earth is and, and when things happened and, and you know, what is a billion years um, into two separate things. One is to talk about the magnitude of time and just how long it is and how much time all of this takes. And to separate that from the actual story, which is a chapter by chapter story. Um, we knew from our own studies that many visitors um, f interpret a lot of the past as, as being simultaneous. So all dinosaurs live at the same time, for example, there is a very common notion. And we wanted to create something that made it hard for that to be um, the message. And so we, we physically separate things that do not or did not live together at the same time. And so the dinosaurs occur in three separate places, for example, um, and they happen in sequence. So even if you don't remember that the Jurassic period was 150 million years ago, you can see that it's farther than the Cretaceous period. And so there's a a visual cue uh, in physical distance that uh, relates to time. Um, the other visitor-centric um, design element that we did um, was to ad admit that we did not want to fight our own visitors in their preferences for how they visit exhibits. Um, and there's a, a great deal of information about um, how visitors move through exhibits. And um, it's very non-linear. They, they tend to pinball around or ping pong around the exhibit. And, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. You see something that interests you, you walk over to that, and then you might skip a few things. And to create narratives that require one to stop at a certain set of stations, for example, really fights that tendency. And uh, we really didn't want to do that. 
So what we did instead was create a space in the exhibit here, uh, which we called the bridge, slightly elevated off to one side. You can step on this space and you can look left and right and see um, about 300 million years of Earth history. And on here are several um, touchscreen interactive exhibits that cover different topics that are geared toward a sort of summary um, or a kind of whole picture view of the history of life on Earth. So you can see this 300 million years and you can learn about this 300 million years without having to go through step by step each space. And then we inverted that um, in an area we call the base camp, where we had questions that we knew were uh, very important and popular uh, questions, but which did not live, so to speak, in a particular time. Um, people often want to understand more about how fossils form. What is the fossilization process like? Um, that doesn't logically go into the Triassic period, for example, any more than it goes into the Paleogene. Um, uh, how do we find out how old fossils are? Um, you know, what does it take to find a fossil? These are these are functional questions of importance. You know, how does evolution work? And so we we extracted them into this space. It's a space where we can have um, education and outreach activities, and where there are more hands-on uh, things for visitors to do to interact with those questions. Um, but we they're really more about process um, than they are about any particular fossil. Now, having made all of those major decisions, um, some of which uh, took a little bit uh, more time than others, the actual design of the exhibit um, also uh, proceeds in great detail. Um, on the top is a very uh, early rendering of an exhibit case where we had a sense of the fossils we wanted in this case. Um, they're very uh, generally rendered here and laid out in a temporary um, plan. On the bottom, uh, we've now made uh, certain selections, we know what these fossils are, they're actually based on real specimens, and the layout is much more final to the extent that we're actually developing artwork to go behind them. Um, and you can sort of see, you know, we didn't do too badly in the beginning, <clears throat> but there are some major shifts, for, even in fossil content um, from top to bottom, and, and there are, you know, some uh, dozens of these cases. So each one of these goes through this, this process. And this works all the way down to the levels of the individual specimens, which um, for me was sort of my, the favorite part of working on this exhibit uh, was the ability to, <clears throat> to know that we were going to be able to renovate the actual specimens. Um, many of them had been on display for decades. Um, and so um, the hope was that we would create things that would survive equally long in this exhibit. Um, here's one example. <clears throat> this is um, a Jurassic predatory dinosaur called Allosaurus. Um, this specimen was found in the 1800s by uh, crews working for Othniel Marsh at Yale, came to the museum at the turn of the 20th century, uh, was described in detail about 1920. <clears throat> the skull was put on display around that time um, by itself, sort of uh, in a case. And the skeleton wasn't put up until 1981 uh, in a pretty nice pose. It's a nice, it's a hunting pose. Um, and there's nothing particularly wrong with it, uh, but the specimen being a real fossil needed quite a lot of conservation work. There were some anatomical errors that needed to be corrected. So um, it was an opportunity again to kind of revisit it. Um, one thing in particular was the skull. On the left is a drawing of that from 1920. And on the right is the skull as it was in the exhibit <clears throat> and, as, and as, as was put together in, in about 1919. And um, pieces of the skull were not preserved and so in reconstructing it originally, uh, Charles Gilmore, who was the curator at the time, acknowledged that it was not clear uh, exactly how to get everything back together. And he inadvertently uh, telescoped the skull a bit. So it's, it's very short. Um, but for many years, this wasn't really understood. And it was considered to be a very strange Allosaurus, this kind of short-faced Allosaurus. And there's been a lot of debate about this. Um, we were able to remove the reconstruction reconstructed parts and uh, realign them. Um, for example, we were missing certain bones on the left, but had them on the right. We could scan them, mirror image them, and then print a duplicate for the other side. And in doing all that work, we achieved a much more um, accurate representation of the skull that uh, actually aligns very, very well with uh, what we know of the skull of this animal from other specimens. So it was very heartening to see. Um, it's about a third longer, so it's a pretty significant change. And then the idea to present it in a pose that was not maybe what was going to be expected 
of someone coming to see this Allosaurus. Um, it's, it's really got, gets to be kind of <clears throat> old news to see a predatory dinosaur doing predatory things. That, that doesn't mean you don't want to have some, but there's no need for them all to be doing the same thing. It's not typical for what predators do anyway. Most of the time they're asleep. Um, so I wanted to show something here that was uh, more about the rest of the animal's life. And um, we do have uh, quite a nice collection from a, a, a site in Wyoming of Allosaurus eggs and baby Allosaurus bones. So it was a great opportunity to put those two pieces of information together and to present this animal um, sitting on the ground near a nest of its own eggs um, it's a much different message than uh, you might otherwise expect to get. Um, and RCI did a wonderful job with this mount with all of the original material there. Another example, uh, Ceratosaurus, a contemporary uh, dinosaur of Allosaurus, um, smaller. This was for many years the only specimen of this dinosaur known. Um, and it had literally been in this same mount for, since 1911. It was wall mounted and it hadn't really been touched. Um, and there's quite a bit more we know about Ceratosaurus. Also, as a type specimen, it was time to put this back in the collections. So we, were, we needed to make a duplicate of it. That required essentially excavating it from the wall, um, which was a task um, in and of itself. And it became a larger task when we discovered that um, many of the bones were still in the original sandstone blocks. They'd only been prepared on the visible side um, with good reason because the sandstone was about as hard as a piece of cement. So it took our team of preparators about a year to get this specimen out. Um, on the left, you'll see sort of what they end up looking like. Uh, many of them still in their natural connection, finally freed completely from the rock. We could then mold them and cast them. And in some cases, as in the upper right picture, um, there's a cast of the skull. By making a number of different casts of the skull, uh, Mike Holland there was able to reinflate it because it had been pancaked in two dimensions. And so we could get a nice 3D version of the animal's head for the first time. We wanted to mount it with our Stegosaurus and very tight quarters, very closely mounted. The Stegosaurus was mounted first, and then we used a life-size cardboard cutout, a very analog way of testing this pose out, to place it on a model of the platform and make sure it, it didn't hit any of the obstacles that were gonna be there, and it was still gonna be a realistic looking mount. And only then do we actually start putting together the, um, the plaster um, cast of the uh, skeleton. And in its final form, it's uh, very, as I said, very tight space, but but um, on its own platform, um, unsuccessfully preying on a stegosaurus. Uh, I really wanted to, again, convey the idea here that it's, it's not always a winning game being a predator. Uh, herbivores are not particularly happy to be dinner and many of them are quite capable of defending themselves. And so in this case, stegosaurus is not gonna succeed. Um, the added benefit of um, removing the specimen is that we now get to study it in the 21st century when it was last studied 100 years ago. So um, we're undertaking a complete redescription of it and we have already done some preliminary CT scans of the skull, which you see on the right, uh, which in the early stages showed us importantly what was and was not real bone. Um, we could probably figure out how old this individual was, uh, which helps us to understand whether there's more than one species out there. Um, and we can look at elements like the toe bones on the left and decide whether um, this represents some sort of injury or perhaps a disease that this animal uh, suffered with. Uh, we had another um, iconic specimen in our hall, Stegosaurus, the type specimen here. We did keep this on display and it was originally mounted in the floor of the exhibit flat um, where I think it was fairly underwhelming for most of our visitors. Um, and it was used as a display about how, how dinosaurs are excavated um, because it was uh, never uh, taken apart from the original death pose that it was found in. And I did want to keep that. I didn't want to disrupt this lovely pose, um, but better to present it in a way where people get up closer to it. So it's a vertically mounted specimen now, and it really does show off the size um, of the animal much better. And you can get to appreciate the quality of the fossil material as well. Non-dinosaurs, just for those of you who may have an affection for them, we had our old, old Dimitrodon mount. Um, we tried to uh, liven that up, uplift it instead of dragging its, um, its behind on the floor. And it's actually interacting uh, with its own pedestal, looking down off the edge at this um, curled up 
animal called Ophiacodon. And that was a skeleton that was found in, again, in a death pose. So it's sort of sniffing at a potential meal. Um, but all of these, of course, as the previous uh, picture hints at, um, are parts of uh, exhibitry and exhibit experiences. They're not isolated uh, presentations of skeletons. And um, so I want to give you an example of a couple of, of of those where we uh, to show you how we can sort of put those together. Um, one other thing um, that we decided is we weren't we weren't going to do the the story of the evolution of horses, um, which is a very popular story about evolution, um, but kind of kind of overdone. Uh, many 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 museums have this story told, um, and. To my mind, it's, all, it's not the ideal evolution story. It's a great story because we have so much data on it. But um, even when you're talking about some horses graze and some horses browse and some horses do this and some horses do that, they're all pretty horse-like. Um, and I wanted to explore an option where evolution had produced uh, a more surprising range. Um, and so uh, we settled on uh, rhinoceros because we have a pretty good collection of these and the story is pretty interesting and, and not as well known. Um, rhinos were very, very diverse and, and only one kind of rhino is the rhino we have today, which we consider you know, so iconic. And so, um, you know, if you ask somebody what a rhino looks like, they're going to come up with the same thing. But in the past, there were rhinos that look like giraffes and rhinos that look like hippos and rhinos that look like tapers and deer. And, you know, there's a huge variety and we're left with just this one sort of twig on the tree. So to do that, we had um, to come up with a nice uh, way of um, presenting that family tree and relating it to our fossils. So we, we went through a bunch of iterations of that before we got to the version on the right. Uh, we want to illustrate the specimens themselves. So we do have these technical drawings, which indicate what is real and what is cast. Um, and then we have life drawings uh, as well of those animals. Uh, this is by an artist, uh, Davide Bonadonna. Um, and they're brought together in the top on this uh, reader rail, um, where there's a story that they're brought together, which we talk about um, the radiation of these animals and what does it mean to be a big animal? Um, there are a lot of pluses and minuses to that story. So why would you do it? Um, and uh, we make sure to sort of discuss the difference between evolving to be big and growing to be big and what the difference is there. Um, to get the animals uh, into a place where we felt they were doing their job for us, uh, we took our older mounts, which generally speaking are what I kind of call take my picture mounts or, you know, trophy mounts. They're just really mostly standing there. Um, not doing anything in particular. And, you know, with the mammals, it's nice because you can look at a living version or a living relative and, and take some inspiration from that. So we took rhinos, in this case, some running or charging rhinos, head down, um, and use that for this teleoceros. Um, and then for uh, this little small rhino called Monoceros, we took this very characteristic resting pose for rhinos and tucked that one down, um, bedded in the grass perhaps, bring them all together in this panoply of uh, rhino diversity uh, with that uh, ex explanatory panel in front. And it, it forms its own uh, sort of exhibit niche. Um, we have a lot of artwork in the hall and that undergoes a similarly scrutinous uh, passage. Um, this is just one example of a Cretaceous dinosaur scene from Canada, backdropping a display of these animals in our exhibit um, that talks about dinosaur diversity. Uh, the artist is Julius Chotoni, and it starts with a, a sketch that is based on the um, descriptions that we provide and uh, an under um, underlying set of examples and specimens and such. And, and that those sketches are kind of worked on in terms of layout and, and the details of the animals and plants until we agree on something um, in its basic form. And then that starts to get fleshed out and colored in. And uh, I, I personally took, take a fairly conservative approach to the coloration of animals, particularly big animals. Um, so a lot of this is obviously speculative, but there's but we try to have some logic uh, beneath it. Once we're happy with that, we work that through and Julius gets it to its final form uh, with all this lovely texture and lighting. And it ends up in the backdrop here um, where those animals, as I said, are in the foreground as uh, fossil specimens. And so, you know, we don't have a room that has a lot of walls anymore. So we don't have murals that are acting as actual scenery. 
um, but instead as illustrations. Uh, we have a number of sculptural elements as well, um, particularly um, important to uh, have tactile experiences as well as visual experiences in the hall. Um, we have um, a display of Paleocene mammals that represents the early diversification of mammals after the extinction of the dinosaurs, the first kind of bigger mammals to evolve. Um, these aren't terribly well known, um, but we do have some material to show and we, there are um, a number of experts that outside the building consulted and worked through uh, to settle on a design um, and then drew inspiration as this one is a predator from uh, modern wolves and their relatives to come up with a pose and so we have this kind of charming resting pose with a yawn in fact in the final version the only update is really there's a little bit of a curl to the tongue um, and so it's a very friendly uh, object in the hall for people to visit uh, in another section we have cretaceous mammals where we talk about mammal reproduction and we have this example, which is a Cretaceous monotreme. So it's an egg-laying mammal. Uh, we wanted to show, again, a touchable reproduction of the living form. Unfortunately, um, the little tiny brown speck inside that circle is the only fossil that we have of Steropodon. And so we have almost no idea what it really looks like. Um, we could make some educated guesses about things like, well, you know, uh, the common ancestor of today's monotremes, the echidna and the platypus, doesn't they don't share a lot in common, but they, you know, they have a fairly sprawled posture of their limbs. Uh, they have pretty muscular tails. And then the rest of this is a, um, not even an educated, well, it's an educated guess, but not even a, a sort of um, a refined guess. And, and I, we felt quite uncomfortable with that and didn't want to just have a note. And what we decided to do is actually have the sculpture itself be pixelated. And so whether you're looking at it or touching it, you can sense that there's something wrong here or something different here. And we talk about why did we do this? Um, and it, you know, it's a nice way to symbolize the uncertainty. Um, evolution gets brought up a couple different ways in the hall. Um, and we, we recognize the challenge of discussing the on the ground process of evolution, which we handle in our base camp. In other words, generation to generation, um, the uh, selection of traits and the, and the uh, generation of new species. And then in the paleontological record, what is a, it ten, tends to be a much larger view of evolution, um, which is the kind of broad patterns that we see, animal groups evolving to be big or evolving to um, become aquatic, things like that, which happens over millions or tens of millions of years. So we, ha we, we address both of those processes. Uh, here we talk about the evolution of birds, and again, we use this family tree as a way to indicate the successive acquisition of different features. Um, we try to represent it both artistically and technically in our illustrations, and then also to just kind of um, imbue the space with a little bit of the feeling we want. We also uh, created a um, mechanical model um, that hangs from the ceiling and replicates a flight stroke of a bird. And it doesn't do anything more than that. The flight stroke is, is quasi accurate, but it is, um, it is the summary of everything we talk about in the evolutionary tree, the ability of these animals to fly. Um, it's paired with a more technical um, touchscreen video where um, users can choose a feature and watch the stepwise evolution of that feature. And we thought that it was particularly important to emphasize that every step of this evolution um, is an evolution of, on its own. These animals are not evolving with the idea of becoming birds. They're evolving for the moment they live in. And so each of the changes has to work for the animal. So we talk about what the function might be for um, the, each of the changes uh, that are, that's seen. Um, in this evolution. Um, and then we also have a place where we kind of invert all of that. And we say, well, let's boil down the, your own body into an evolutionary experience. And here people can explore um, through a human character, um, various features that we all possess and talk about the origin of those features. So if you were to select um, the belly button, it would travel you back in time, um, some uh, 90 million years to the first mammals that first placental mammals or the first uh, relatives of those mammals that had an umbilical cord. 
Um, if you selected lungs, it would take you back many hundreds of millions of years to the first fishes in which lungs evolved. And so it talks about, you know, these are origins and then the things that you possess, the idea being your body um, is itself an evolutionary story. And finally, probably the most challenging uh, content wise was what we call the age of humans gallery. Uh, we wanted to have a small space in the hall where uh, we could ask people to think about the, the story of the past in the context of the life they live today and the future. Um, and it's challenging for a lot of reasons. Obviously, it's, it can be a very sensitive and emotional topic, but it also um, it needs to relate to the hall. You don't want people to enter um, a gallery like this and say, why, why is this in a paleo, paleontology hall? And so one of the things we talk about, um, especially um, is uh, scale and rate. Um, these are things that are common in, in past events of earth history that are of importance, things like mass extinctions or, or um, abrupt climate change in the past. It's not that the temperature is 20 degrees different, it's that it happens over such a short span of time that it has this outsized effect. Um, and the same thing for an asteroid impact or an enormous vulcanis vulcanism event. Um, it's the scale and the rate. And so those are the places where it can relate to us, where we talk about it's not, you know, that you or I do a particular thing, but you multiply it by many billions of people and the scale becomes quite impressive. And so does the, the rate. And so it was meant to be uh, challenging, but also encouraging, uh, which is a very thin line to walk. Um, there's an engagement space where people can um, um, pinpoint topics of interest to them. And it's also a place where we can try to learn from the visitors how they're responding. So unfortunately, it, hasn't been, it wasn't open very long, but we're eager to get this open uh, again in particular. So, you know, here we are. This is what the hall looked like at the opening of its last renovation. Um, and, you know, it was a very enjoyable hall and uh, did, a, did a fine job, but had a lot of constraints. And... As sad as we were to take it down, um, we were very happy to have the opportunity um, to be able to start fresh and to tell uh, the story of life on Earth in a very different way from what we've done in the past. Um, so here's basically the same view, um, a little bit tilted uh, over, but looking down the same direction. Um, and also to just have such a nice space to live it for it to live in again um, uh, is, is really kind of refreshing. It's, it feels um, like a much more pleasant place to be uh, than it used to be. Um, so, you know, it did take a long time. It was a seven and a half year project from uh, the first, uh, first starting moment um, till the day we opened it. But um, in the end, I, I, uh, for all of us, I think it was something that uh, it's hard to imagine being part of something bigger um, and sort of more impactful for the museum. So it was really a privilege to do. And although you can't come and visit us, um, we do have a virtual tour online. Um, it is the self-driven virtual tour, but I, I do encourage you to, to visit it um, because it's, it's very high resolution. And so you can actually zoom in and uh, read a lot of the labels if you're so interested, in addition to just explore the space. Um, so it's, you know, it's not like being there. I hope you can come and visit us when we're open again. But in the meantime, I do encourage you to, to drop by in a virtual sense. I will also say thank you very much. Uh, and I'll be happy to uh, take questions from you all. Thank you, Matthew. So this is the time for all of you to submit your questions. We, we do have um, a few coming in, so we'll give the public a few minutes to type their questions. So Matthew, I, I worked at the uh, museum for almost a decade, and it's just incredible the, the change of that that space. Uh, you, you really have done a magnif magnificent job. And I, I mean, how many people, I know you mentioned earlier in your talk that there were different teams with different expertise. Um, can you give us a sense of how many people were involved? It's, I think because there's so many different parts of the project, it's actually hard. And I wish I had a, a real number number. Um, you know, everybody who did something, it's certainly north of 100 people by a fair margin. Um, 
I, I would say in a, in a, even in a regular worked on it, you know, for more than a year, it's, it's probably at least 50 people who were individually on it for more than a year apiece. Um, it just, it, it's so involved, you know, at some point as the scientist, you know, who's, who's really a content focused person, you know, you're being presented with like a diagram in which, you know, the lengths of every individual screw are also indicated. And you realize just like how deep the bench of talent must be in a project like this for yeah. it to come, you know, to come together. Yeah. So we have um, a question from Courtney, and she asks, as science is ever changing, is there anything in the exhibit hall that is already out of <laughs> Well, uh, the nice thing about paleontology um, is that there's always a little bit of uncertainty around things. So um, I look at out of date, you know, in, in a technical sense, things can go out of date very quickly, but in the sense of, a, of an idea, you know, generally somebody will publish a new idea. And my view is that's the beginning of a conversation about that idea. And so I like to, you know, new ideas should marinate a little bit in the scientific discourse. So yes, there's some pieces of information, new ideas that have come out and we have left ourselves the ability to, to update things. Um, so, you know, as things move ahead, um, if for example, um, we decide that uh, this group of dinosaurs is, has a different relationship to another group of dinosaurs. We can print a new uh, graphic and, you know, replace that, for example. So um, that can all happen. Um, but uh, it's my hope that the higher level pieces of information don't get overturned too quickly. Um, Jamie wants to know what was the most rewarding part of renovating the exhibits for you personally and along those lines, what was your favorite prehistoric organism in the hall? Hmm. Uh, so the favorite thing for me was definitely putting, getting to work on putting the dinosaurs back together and to be able to think about, you know, what pose they might be in and to, you know, to make some of those decisions. Um, it was the thing for me as a kid who loved dinosaurs, that was the thing that I first you know, the first impression you get is that. And so you're, you know, to be able to do that is, uh, was very meaningful for me. Um, and the knowledge that most of the time these skeletons aren't going to change much. Um, and so it's going to be the longest lasting part of the exhibit. You know, the labels and such, we can change those fairly easily, but you know, it's a few hundred thousand dollars to change the T-Rex skeleton, unless it's really wrong. It's not coming down anytime soon. Well, I can um, ask you, um, you had a T-Rex, but we know you do. Mm -hmm. We do. We have, the, we have a new T-Rex and we didn't, we had a cast of one. So the one we have now is a real specimen. Um, T-Rex is not my favorite dinosaur. I, I, that is a heretical thing to say, um, but so working on the mount. What's that? I, I was going to say, does that mean that you don't want to buy the one that is going on sale? I, I have no comment about uh, any auction dinosaur. Um, okay, for those who don't know about that, you, you can Google that later. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but, but that was actually probably the most exciting mount to work on because it was the most technically challenging. Um, and it, you know, if done right, we knew it was sort of going to be the one with the biggest payoff for the visitors. So one question from Terrence, what is the most recent fossil on display in the new exhibit? So uh, there's two ways to answer that question, Terrence. Um, the most recent fossil in the terms of the one the museum got most recently um, is a very beautiful fossil of uh, an ancient horse, um, a re relative of something called Hyracotherium called uh, Protorhippus. Um, very beautiful. It's probably the size of a dog um, and it's almost perfectly preserved. Um, the youngest thing that we have in the hall that's considered a fossil would be something from the ice ages. And so these are things that are, you know, to my mind, only uh, 10,000 or so years old. And, or actually we have a Moa skeleton that's, um, you know, probably just in the, in the hundreds of years old. So, um, Andrew, who is almost five years old. Thank you, Andrew, for being with Hi, us uh, tonight. Um, where is the best place on the East Coast to find a um, megalodon tooth or fossils that are still out in nature? So megalodon teeth are, are 
uh, found up and down the East Coast. Um, I don't think they're, they're very common, say, in New England. Um, but once you get down to Maryland, Virginia, and further south, um, you can find Megalodon teeth. And, and there's a number of places, even on the beach today, or oftentimes you'll find them where like a river will, will flow out to the ocean on the banks of those rivers. If you look in the, uh, in the rocks there, you can find them. Um, as you go farther north, the beaches and the, the sediments change and you tend not to have as much of that, but, um, but they're, not, they're not uncommon at all. And in fact, you can find them um, a few hours drive from Washington, DC even. Um, a lot of people want to know, and I think you get this question a lot, what is your favorite yeah. dinosaur? Oh, so we get all those questions. I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't have a favorite dinosaur. Um, I feel like that's like having a favorite kid. Um, although since I only have one kid, that's easy. But um, I tend to have favorite dinosaurs of the moment, um, and I, I often enjoy the um, you know the dinosaurs that sort of don't get the attention. So I always had a soft spot for Ceratosaurus because it wasn't. Uh, a dinosaur that was as famous as something like a T-Rex. Um, in our exhibit, we have a little dome-headed dinosaur called Stegosaurus, S-T-E-G-O-C-E-R-A-S. And it, um, I, I had it posed um, scratching its face just because I thought it was sort of a cute thing to do. Um, so curator, you, you could make those decisions. Yeah, so I think, you know, we had a team of people, we all had to sort of agree, but in general, it was my job to kind Have of the last word. start that, yeah, start, well, start the conversation, right? So um, there are a number of amounts that other people made those decisions in the end because they had better ideas than I did. Um, um, Gabriel wants to know, one, what ended up not making the final cut in the museum that you wish it did? Well, um, I think for the, you know, for the dinosaurs, uh, we did pretty well. I think if we had had more space, you know, we, we ended up, we ended up having many fewer fossil mammals than we had in the old hall. Um, and to be truth be told, the fossil mammals took up a lot more space than their time on earth would suggest. Um, and it's because we had a very robust history of people at the museum studying them. And now we, we, it's, it's moved on to other topics. Um, so they, but, so there's some really lovely fossil mammal specimens that we don't put out. We had, um, you know, we have a mummified woolly mammoth remains. We have, um, we had a second ground sloth that we didn't put out. Um, so we just have, the, and they're all lovely, but we, you know, we have a ground sloth out. So you know, two ground sloths is twice as nice, but one is nice enough, we hope. Um, so there's a lot of mammals that are, that are back in the collections um, that it would have been nice just to have the room for. Yes. Um, Heather asks a question, which is, um, I think, very relevant for anyone out there who uh, is curious about how exhibits are made. Um, is there ever conflict between researchers and exhibitors? Regarding yeah, I think, specimens on display for, for the public versus availability for studying. Is there tension there? Yeah, I think there is. There's always tension, I think, between the sort of three groups, the museum groups I talked about. Um, but in the, you know, in the best situation, that tension, it, it, it sort of becomes the energy that drives everything along. It doesn't have to be like fighting about stuff. Um, and so what it usually represents is just a different sets of priorities and you want to kind of come to a middle ground. Um, when it comes to fossils, for example, the mo it's not so much that um, someone exhibits would say, please, let's put out the T-Rex. And I would say, no. Um, what happens more often is a curator like me says, please put out this very scientifically important, but incredibly difficult to understand fossil. And then exhibits people say, well, how am I going to explain this to anybody? Um, and so a lot of the conversation ends up in that direction where, you know, we curators, we love our fossils and we, we think everybody loves them all the way we do, but they're not, they're not all equally good at telling the story. So I think it helped that pretty early on, we, we came to a place where we all kind of understood what we needed to be doing. And so um, there were always a fossil here and a fossil there that, you know, each of us wished could be out there, but I think overall, and we all felt like real fossils wherever we could should be out. Um, 
except where the fossil might not survive. Um, so I think we were all on the same page for that. I think that that helped us, you know, move along through this process pretty smoothly. That's great. Um, Anne would like to know whether um, after changing the um, exhibit, after updating it, did you find that you reach more audiences? I mean, I, I know that the museum is, it's one of the most visited museums in the country. I think you have about 7 million visitors a year, uh, which of course, insane, unfortunately yeah. you're not going to have this year, but um, yeah, did you see, did you experience more traffic in the, in the hall? So uh, I honestly don't have the answer for that. Um, this year was the year where we were going to uh, perform a very extended visitor study. Mm -hmm. So we've had to delay that um, until we're reopened. Um, and so we do, we do track things like, you know, how many people and, and who are they and where they're coming from. Uh, but we do also get people who will agree to sit down and talk to us in some detail about their experience. Um, and so I don't really have an answer for you at the moment. Um, I will say the numbers themselves, personally, I'd be surprised if the numbers change that much because, you know, we get a lot of visitors and the museum is free. And so um, people can come and go whenever they want. I don't think that's going to change. And I don't think someone's going to get on a plane to Washington just because we renovated the dinosaurs at the Smithsonian. I think they're going to come anywhere. I would. Well, yes. We, um, but people come to Washington no matter what. And so I think... Um, that overall picture probably will be the picture, but how, what they get out of it and, and things like that, we hope will be quite different. So, um, but unfortunately it'll be till next year, I think, till we, till we know that. So I think that people, we are all hoping that we will be able to travel soon. And, and I'm sure that there are people listening to us right now who are thinking, planning to visit DC and visiting the museum. Um, Nina wants to know, What's the biggest takeaway you'd like visitors to get from the updated exhibit once they're able to, to go there? And also someone else asked, how much time should a visitor plan to, <laughs> to be in the hall to really take it in? I would say that the best thing, but the short answer for the second one, the best thing about taking it in would be to visit more than once. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not meant to be something where you just went for six hours and read everything and then you got it all. I think the idea is to let yourself explore and enjoy it, go see something else, come back another day and do another thing. Um, and so, you know, spend an hour or so and then come back. Um, if I had to think about something that I you know, really wanted, you know, we, 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 we talked a lot about this, you know, what is the thing you want to say to people with the exhibit? Um, and, and I think, you know, the idea that we really try to promote is that, um, you know, I'm going to be a little cumbersome about this because we don't have a sort of, you know, standard line. But I would say the world we live in, um, we have inherited this world from the past. And understanding that past helps us understand our world and the world that will come after this. So I think the continuity of past and present and future is, a, is probably the main um, kind of message throughout um, the, the exhibit. And that is a very important message. So we um, have reached 7 p.m. and we have a few more questions, but for those who may have to uh, go, we thank you for joining us. And Matt, if you can stay with us just a few minutes, we have yeah, sure. other uh, questions. Um, so Hui, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, asks, since the museum is closed, do you still have staffs and researchers doing anything at this time in the museum? And you particularly, given that you uh, work with what I imagine are, are large specimen right. how are you how are you conducting your research uh, right now uh, yeah so we are I mean we're closed closed so we have only a very small number of um, staff in the building right now um, and that does not include me um, or uh, really any of the curators so most of us are at home um, working on um, 
manuscripts for our research that we need to publish, for example. Um, we can do obviously uh, things on the web like this. Um, mostly I'm writing, writing things I haven't been able to write because I was working on the exhibit for so long. So um, there's, there's always a lot of stuff that, that you can do that isn't always a hands-on thing. Um, but when I get to the point where I need to handle a fossil, I, I might be stuck. So um, Tina said that you um, had mentioned the anatomical error. What does this term mean? Uh, that's just my unofficial way of saying um, it's, it's um, you know, for most of these fossil animals, um, you know, we don't have every single bone. Um, you're missing pieces of it. Um, you may not miss a lot, but always something. And so whenever you see an exhibit in the museum, someone has most of the time filled that in. And there are times where you can just get a different specimen and you're fine. And there's times you have to say, well, I don't really know what this looks like. I'll, you know, I'll model it on a different species or something like that. And sometimes you're wrong. I mean, you find it, you make a new discovery and you realize you made it wrong. So uh, what I'm talking about is just pieces of the skeleton that were wrong. Um, not so much in how they're put together, but in what they look like. Mackenzie has a very specific question. Um, ah, she, noticed, <laughs> she noticed that there was a sign that said spike versus claw. Um, is that concept of evolutionary trait X versus evolutionary trait Y a constant in the gallery? And if yes, was the idea to show how different traits evolved and can serve similar functions or was there another rationale? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, and I, I'm, I'm a little sad to say that it's not actually a, um, a, a constant in the gallery, although that is an, an interesting way to, to present that idea if someone's out there thinking of doing their own exhibit. Um, in that case, it's, um, it really is a, a more uh, kind of functional thing. So we have the stegosaurus and the stratosaurus. And what we've done uh, for people is uh, made molds of the spike on the stegosaurus tail and um, one of the teeth of ceratosaurus and people can touch them. And that is just sort of the theme of um, predator and prey um, that, um, you know, these are sort of parallel structures, um, but it's not something that we, we repeat through the hall in that format. Um, uh, we do talk about the idea of what trait, how traits evolve and, and can serve similar functions in different groups again, but we, it's not, it's not a, um, um, it's not like a, a phrase we, we reuse or a format. So Chloe has uh, what I think is a really fun question. I'm sure you, um, you're asked this all the time, but if Jurassic Park or world was real, would you visit? Um, where in the movie timeline are we talking about? I think uh, that's the big question. Um, yeah, I, you know, it would be hard to say no. Um, so I think, I think it would be worth it, the risk, um, honestly. Um, so I probably would go. Well, if you were in a safe laboratory, right? Like that. Yeah, I mean, I might, well, that didn't really work out for them in the movie though. So, I mean, I'm not sure it matters. Um, I probably would do it. I think so. <laughs> um, Let's see, um, you said that visitors, this is Hannah, um, have a tendency to bounce around from one thing to another. Is there any particular part of the exhibit you hope people do not overlook? Yeah, so I think, um, <clears throat> you know, the exhibit is, is, it's quite full of stuff, right? And so any one person isn't gonna see everything. Um, and uh, I saw a similar question about, you know, are there Easter eggs in the exhibit? Um, there are things in there that we hope people notice. Um, what I hope is that, is that um, in the larger sense, people don't just stay in the main path, that they, they actually choose to kind of venture down these other routes, um, because there's lots of stuff kind of on secondary pathways um, that, you know, I hope people do get to take the time to see. And I'm sort of waiting for people to bring up stuff that we stuck into the exhibit um, that I haven't heard anybody talk about yet. You know, so as, as one example, and I'm only going to give you one, um, we have a, a mechanical model that you can manipulate, which shows how fish 
uh, sort of advanced fishes feed where like if you've ever seen a fish, you know, the fish face um, is an actual, you know, adaptation to kind of push the mouth out and then draw in water with a prey item. And we have a little model you can, you can handle that, that mimics that with a fish and the prey item is like a little 3D printed um, goldfish cracker. Um, but I haven't heard anybody say that yet. So I haven't, I don't know if, if nobody's noticed it, um, but there's a bunch of stuff like that in there. Um, so I hope people don't miss those either. Um, Nina wants to know, has paleontology been able to utilize 3D printing in a meaningful way? Besides the goldfish cracker. Um, yeah, so the, the really, for, for this exhibit in particular, but, but paleontology in general, um, it's um, represented a, a real, the, the sort of affordability of it has now represented a big advance because um, now that people are starting to have scans of their fossils, uh, you don't necessarily have to like get on a plane and go to Beijing. You could download the fossil and print it right there and essentially handle it. Um, and so for a lot of people, I mean, you know, th that kind of travel is not that feasible um, for a variety of reasons. And so it, you know, it really opens up a lot. Um, in addition for something like an exhibit, the replication of things that we might be missing um, is really nice um, to do with 3d technology and, for some of the mounts, we were we would um, print the skeleton at a like one tenth scale, and then we could manipulate it, decide on the pose, and then move on to things like metalworking. Um, whereas you know normally you would actually start to put it together, and and sort of tweak it as you go, which is a much more difficult process. Um, but in research, it's becoming quite common. People come to the museum now with little portable scanners and scan things. And, um, so uh, I, I see that as being a, a major innovation going, especially going forward in the future. Kate would like to know if there's any audio in the exhibit as in possible sounds that dinosaurs made. Um, <clears throat> there's not that kind of sound mostly. Um, I um, would say probably dinosaurs are not, what you think they sound like in Jurassic Park or whatever. I think they're probably, um, they sound more like crocodiles and ostriches, um, no roaring or screaming. Um, so we don't really kind of do that sort of a sound. We do have ambient sound for some of the videos, for example. Um, and then uh, there are, you know, the different, um, obviously people talking and, and such. Um, but in general, with the number of visitors we get, um, it's very difficult to have like large amounts of ambient sound in that room, it becomes um, just kind of like unbearable. Um, if there's, you know, 3000 people in the space and then there's all this noise. Um, so we generally don't do too much of that um, in the building. Okay. Um, we have a question from Henry, who's seven. Um, you showed hey, that uh, you had a virtual tour of the exhibit, but do you have any programs where someone is, is guiding people uh, through the virtual tour? We don't yet. So um, we just uh, finished those virtual tours in the last few months. And so it, the next step is we're going to, we're going to have that, but we are still developing that. So right now we don't have a guide. I'm sorry to say. Okay. I think we've covered most of the uh, questions from the, from the public. Um, I do appreciate your time, uh, Matthew. Thank you for being with us and sharing this wonderful exhibit. Um, I imagine that there's, there's no telling when the museum will open, or, or maybe, I, I don't know, maybe there are some news. I, I just recently read that some of the Smithsonian museums uh, will be opening this month. Uh, do you have any intel about what's happening at the Natural History um, So, you know, we are we are preparing for opening, but we don't have a, a schedule for that. So um, yeah, at the end of this week, so tomorrow, um, a, a couple more museums will be open at Smithsonian. And each time we do that, we kind of take the new information we learn and uh, work it into our plan for a museum like ours, where we get just tons of people. Um, so I think, you know, we, we're close to having a plan. I think um, we'll need to kind of be in the next stage of, of, the Smithsonian's opening process, um, but I, I just, it's hard to guess a date. Um, uh, so unfortunately I don't have any, I don't have any secret intel. 
Well, I, I hope that it's soon. We also are, are closed at the moment and we don't have an opening date, but who knows, maybe 2021, which is yeah. just around the corner. Maybe. We can all hope. Yes, we can only hope that. So good luck with everything. Thank you so thank you. much again. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. And please visit our website to learn about more of our upcoming programs. Thank you and good night.